Welcome to Canada's most irreverent talk show. This is The Andrew Lawton Show, brought to you by True North. Hello, everyone, and welcome to you all. This is Canada's most irreverent talk show here on True North. Tuesday, November 15th, just after 4.04 p.m. Eastern time. If you are keeping track, I thank you very much for tuning in today. I'm uh, going to be talking a little bit later on about the latest in the Public Order Emergency Commission hearing. Some pretty big evidence coming out this week, notably the confirmation that the RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky did not in fact ask for the Emergencies Act and even a day before the federal government invoked it, advised the federal government she didn't need it. And the big one is the declaration by the CSIS director, David Vigneault, that CSIS did not see a threat to the security of Canada. And you may say, well, what's the big deal? It's CSIS. You know, why, what do they have to do with it? Well, the CSIS Act is what defines the Emergencies Act when it comes to setting out what a threat to the security of Canada is. So if the CSIS folks are saying there's no threat, that seems like a pretty big issue. We'll talk about that a little bit later on with Mark Joseph, who was supposed to be on the show last week, and we had some uh, technical difficulties, but we'll uh, be sure to get John uh, Mark on this time. We have like double, triple, quadruple checked it, so that'll be coming up very shortly. I want to start, though, on a topic that is a fair bit more personal to me, but at the same time, still a significant topic, and one that I hope you'll indulge in, because this is a... This is bigger than partisanship. And it's one of these things that I hope people on the left, on the right, people that don't even care about politics will pay attention to. Back in March of 2021, the Liberal government passed Bill C-7. Now, C-7 in contained a very radical set of reforms to Canada's assisted dying laws. Now, assisted suicide has been legal in Canada since 2016. It was legalized after a Supreme Court of Canada ruling, and the threshold set out in those initial laws involved that someone had to have a grievous and irremediable medical condition. They had to be in profound suffering, and they had to be facing a natural death that was reasonably foreseeable. Which is to say the assisted suicide regime in Canada was meant to be for people that had a terminal condition that was killing them, they knew the direction it was going to go, and the person was suffering. You fast forward to 2021. Bill C-7 expands it dramatically by taking out that section that says a death must be reasonably foreseeable. In other words, someone who is facing a condition that is causing suffering but is not killing them will now be eligible for an assisted suicide. And you may think that is an insignificant change until you consider that it also involves expanding eligibility to include people with mental illnesses. This is, for me, incredibly personal. Some of you may know this, some of you may not. I've written about it in the past, but it doesn't come up every day. In 2010, I nearly succeeded at killing myself. I had been battling depression for years, very serious. I had been in the system, so to speak. I had been trying to uh, get better. I had been seeing a psychiatrist until not long before the suicide attempt, which, as I said in a column I wrote yesterday, was hardly a ringing endorsement of him. I had been on antidepressants. I had seen therapists. I was convinced that there was no hope. I was convinced that life could not get better, and I was convinced that I'd be better off dead. I was suffering. To use the language of Bill C-7, or Canada's Assisted Suicide Laws, I felt what I was going through was grievous and irremediable. I didn't have a reasonably foreseeable natural death, but that part doesn't matter thanks to Bill C-7. Now, I sounded the alarm about this, as did other mental health advocates and organizations in 2021, and the government said, just trust us. They put in a little two-year sunset clause where they determined that, well, we'll just pass the bill as it is, and we'll give it two years for people to come up with regulations, alternatives, we'll do a review, and of course, there's been a little bit of a report on it, some parliamentarians have gotten together, but so far, nothing has changed. And as of March 2023, someone with severe depression, 
someone with schizophrenia, someone with some other mental illness will be able to, for reasons of their mental suffering alone, get an assisted suicide. Whereas it used to be the government devoted its resources and the healthcare system devoted its resources to stopping suicide, now they will sanction it. And I did write about this yesterday, and I've been wanting to say it for a while, and I was trying to find the right time, I was trying to find the right words, because it is difficult. It's difficult to dig back into a time in my life that was so unrecognizable to the life I live now. And I think that is part and parcel of why this is such a problem, because I got better, and the life I'm living is proof that it's possible to get better. But instead, the government is willing to give up on the vulnerable and willing to capitulate to a feeling that is very much coming from a disordered place, that suicide is an answer. It's not. It it never is. Not when you're talking about mental health and mental illness, be it depression, as it was in my experience, or something else. And there's, I get angry about this at just the ghoulishness of people that say this is okay. And you know me, I am about as libertarian as it comes. I believe people should have the right to do what they want up until the point it infringes on the rights of others. I don't support the criminalization of suicide. But there are caveats in that. Even the most ironclad libertarians will say that the government has a role in protecting the vulnerable. And when you're talking about people with mental illness, you're not talking people that have decided based on a complete assessment of all the options available to them that this is what they want to do. You're talking about people for whom the desire to die is a symptom of what it is that's wrong with them. And it's sickening to me. When I think of the healthcare workers, the healthcare workers who slaved tirelessly, who were dedicated to saving my life in 2010, because I very nearly was not here today. I very nearly didn't make it. My family was by my side at the hospital. They were praying. People around the country that knew me were praying. And it was through those prayers that I was saved. And I think God works through healthcare practitioners. So it was through the healthcare practitioners as well that I was saved. But the reason I tell this story is because I want you to understand the juxtaposition of those same healthcare practitioners, the same healthcare system in 2010 working to save my life. In contrast with 2023, when the healthcare system is facilitating people who want to end their lives, when the same healthcare system is there to help people. So under the current rules, if someone goes to a doctor and says, I'm thinking of ending my life, the doctor actually has a duty to protect them. And there's a reason for that, because we understand this is not a normal thing to want. This is not a rational thing to want. So the government is able to intervene. The government is able to keep people in a hospital against their will. Again, I don't support imprisoning people who have done nothing wrong. But we're talking about measures that are there to protect people who are about to commit harm to themselves or to others. In 2023, if someone in the situation I was in in 2010 were to go to their doctor and say, I'm thinking of ending my life, the doctor could say, well, let me give you a referral. Dr. Smith does that. Here you go. That is not healthcare. And, And that is a complete rejection of the line that was given to people when assisted suicide was first coming into Canada, that this was something that was intended to provide death with dignity. That was the line. Death with dignity. It was so that people dealing with degenerative conditions like multiple sclerosis and ALS, who are in excruciating pain, who are declining in their capacity, in their physical and mental capacity, so that these people could have death when they were still a recognizable form of themselves. We can debate that and we can discuss that, but that is very different from what C7 has brought into place. That is very different from the situation that the Canadian public is now finding itself in now, where someone whose suffering is purely mental, very real, but not physical. Someone dealing with an affliction that is not going to end their life, that is not degenerative, 
and that in many cases there could be hope on the horizon for, even if in the moment it doesn't feel like it. This troubles me greatly, and it should trouble all of you. And this isn't a left-right issue, as I said. This isn't about liberal versus conservative. It was quite shameful when the liberal government didn't listen to a growing chorus of people from all aspects of civil society and the opposition parties. And remember, if you go back to 2021, the Senate of Canada tried to put a bunch of reforms in that would deal with this. They tried to do a specific carve-out for people with mental illness. Now, in my view, that wouldn't have saved all the problems with the bill, but it would have at least saved the big glaring one that trips my radar. And the federal government said no. The federal government wouldn't do it, and the Senate eventually caved. The predominantly liberal senators or liberal-appointed senators eventually gave in and just said, okay, we'll pass the bill the way the liberal government wants it, the way Justin Trudeau wants it. I don't often put out calls to action like the one that I'm about to do, but you need to call your members of parliament about this one. If you believe in life, if you believe in human dignity, if you believe that there is hope for people struggling with mental illness, you need to call your liberal members of parliament. This is going to kick in in March of 2023. That gives four months until people in my situation in 2010 could just walk up to a doctor's office and say, I would like you to sign off on my assisted death. There's a review period. You need multiple visits. You need another doctor to sign off as well. It's not like suicide is just dispensed with no notice in the storefront like a Tim Hortons coffee. But there are people that will do it. And one example of this, a quite shameful example, uh, just a couple of months ago, there was a man who applied for assisted suicide because he was unable to get access to affordable housing. And he didn't want to die. He didn't want an assisted death, but he said, well, you know what? It's better than the life I'm living now. There was a woman in April or May earlier this year, I can't remember the exact month, but she was dealing with a chemical sensitivity. She was in affordable housing. She wanted to find alternative housing and she couldn't. And she succeeded at getting an assisted death. Now her issue was not that she wanted to die. She preferred alternatives which were not available to her. So assisted suicide was treated as an expedient option, not as a last resort. And that's what I fear will happen with people struggling with mental illnesses. To put a fine point on this, I am convinced that if the laws that will be around starting in March were there in 2010, I would be dead right now. And again, Twitter discourse being what it is, I'm, I'm, reticent, I'm hesitant to ask the question, would, would the world be better off if that were the case? But I, I hope most people could have the humanity to say, no, it wouldn't, regardless of whatever things we may agree or, or disagree on. But that's the exact type of thing that someone in my situation would have pursued. Because the message the government is sending with this, the message the state is sending is that life is not always worth living. The message they're sending is that suicide is not something should be, that should be stopped, but something that should be perhaps even celebrated. It's just a choice. And I know there are people out there that have struggled or are struggling with mental illness, and I know it's difficult, and I know you don't always want the message of hope. I know I didn't. I, I sure as heck didn't. If someone were to say, oh, it's going to get better, I would have been like, oh, come on, screw you. I've been down this road before. But you know what? Eventually it did. You have to learn for yourself, but it did for me. And I know there are people whose family members are struggling and suffering. And for those people, one thing you should know about this is that if someone goes through the process of medical assistance and dying, there is no consultation with family. Family doesn't even have a right to know about it, let alone to intervene. So someone could quietly and secretly go through this process and you don't know about it until they're dead. So absolutely, I'm mad about this. And absolutely, I think this is a shameful rejection of what healthcare is supposed to be, of what compassion is supposed to be. And just take the politics out of it, of what human dignity is supposed to be. And I don't want anyone to think this is about me trying to impose my values or views on others. It's not about that. I'm not even arguing that we roll back the protections that exist for medical assistance and dying from 2016. 
I'm talking about people who do not have the capacity to consent to their own death. If anyone does, people with serious mental illnesses are not because their desire to end their life is a symptom. So since when do you appease that symptom by giving them what they want and ending their life? Call your members of parliament. I, that's all I can tell you to do right now. They're the ones that made this mess. They are the ones who have to fix it. I promise, I, I always, this is the problem. I normally, I have such a cheery disposition and I could have just done, I guess, like five minutes of suicide jokes, knowing that I have lived experience, so I'm allowed to, but I didn't come up with any good ones. So uh, we're, uh, we're gonna just to get all the lighter stuff into the second end of the show here, because I do want to talk about what's been happening in the Public Order Emergency Commission. It's been a bit of a bigger week this week. And I, I want to talk about this in two particular contexts here, because there was the CSIS memo that came about yesterday and there was also rcmp commissioner brenda lucky's testimony today but before we get into it i want to play a clip for you here in which uh, rob stewart who is uh, formerly the deputy public safety minister acknowledged that CSIS found there was no threat to the security of canada in law take a look so david vigno he stated that at no point did the service being CSIS, assess the protests in ottawa or elsewhere those referred to as the Freedom Convoy and related protests and blockades in January and February 2022 constituted a threat to the security of Canada as defined in Section 2 of the CSIS Act, and that CSIS cannot investigate activities constituting lawful protests. And I, and I take it uh, you were advised of this, correct? Correct. All right. And can we scroll down then to uh, page 7? and go to the heading foreign interference. So Director Vigneau explained that the use of the term foreign influence under Section 2 of the CSIS Act refers to foreign state interference as the term is used within the national security community. Can you just slow down, right. please? Uh, CSIS assessed there was no indication of foreign state interference occurring in the course of the protest. CSIS did not assess that any foreign state supported the protest through funding, that foreign states deployed covert or overt disinformation techniques, or that any foreign state actors attempted to enter into Canada to support the protest. And I take it that you were advised of that by CSIS and Director Vigneault, is that correct? That is correct. All right. And if we can go down to page number eight, and the heading recommendation to cabinet. There, Director Venu states that he learned that the EA referenced the threat definition set out in section two of the CSIS Act once the federal government began to seriously consider invoking the EA between February 10th and 13th. He requested that the service prepare a threat assessment on the risks associated with the invocation of the EA. He felt an obligation to clearly convey the service's position that there did not exist a threat to the security of Canada as defined by the service's legal mandate. The threat assessment prepared by the service was that the invocation of the emergencies legislation risked further inflaming IMV rhetoric and individuals holding accelerationist or anti-government views. You were told that, is that correct? That is correct. All right. That was from Freedom Convoy organizers lawyer Brendan Miller in his cross-examination of former Deputy Minister of Public Safety Rob Stewart. But again, I want to just contextualize this. The CSIS Act is what defines threats to the security of Canada. It is that definition that is at the basis of the Emergencies Act when it comes to public order emergencies. So if CSIS is advising, you know what, our intelligence is that this doesn't exist, where on earth is the government getting its vastly superior intelligence from? Joining me now is Mark Joseph, who is a litigator with the Democracy Fund, which has been, uh, if you've been following the commission hearings closely, uh, putting a lot of tough questions to the witnesses. Mark, it's good to talk to you. Thanks for coming on today. Thanks for having me on, Andrew. Now, I mean, let me just ask a slightly facetious question, but I think there's a serious undertone to it. Why did the commission even reconvene today after that? I mean, when, when the CSIS intelligence is uh, putting evidence forward, the CSIS director, that there was no threat, that should just like end the whole thing. Everyone go home. Yeah, I mean, look, they got to they got to go through their mandate. Uh, so the commission is going to be here for, I think, six weeks until November 25th. 
Um, and they gotta leave no stone unturned, but yeah, yesterday's uh, evidence was fairly damning, I think, for the reasons you, you outlined. Explain to me where things are going from here, because obviously we're getting more into the federal story right now. We had the federal uh, bureaucrats yesterday. Today we had uh, Brenda Lucky with the RCMP. Uh, eventually we're going to be hearing from federal cabinet ministers and, and Justin Trudeau. Like, what is it that the federal government needs to do to save its case at this point, if it even can? That's a great question, and I'm sure the government lawyers will be asking that uh, when they caucus. Uh, look, I'm not. I'm not sure. I mean, we we heard um, the National Security and Intelligence Advisor uh, mentioned, and I, to be honest, I hadn't heard of this department uh, before. But I assume they're something like the equivalent of the the NSA uh, for the United States, um, and, and they're going to be uh, giving evidence, I think, in camera. So. You're right. There's a problem for the government because the the evidence for uh, violence, serious violence, as defined under Section Two of the CSIS Act, has been thin on the ground. Um, so it's it hasn't come from RCMP. It hasn't come from OPP, OPS, Windsor Police, um, and then we've heard about the the um, you know the document that was the, put to the witnesses with respect to no evidence of uh, national security threat. So. What we have left, I guess, is the this NSIA that may have evidence about serious violence or uh, IMVs, as they're calling it, ideologically motivated violent extremists. Um, but we don't know because we haven't heard any of that yet. Um, and we may not hear it if it's in camera. So I just don't know what, what's left for the government. That, I think that's actually an important point because we, we know that the CSIS panel, the director and deputy director, are going to be testifying in camera as well. So there's going to be some evidence that's put before the commission. And as I understand it, because it's in camera, even the other party's lawyers are not there. So there's no cross-examination. Do I understand that correctly? That's right. We won't know about it. Um, it's just the government of Canada, uh, the commission lawyers, I believe, and uh, Commissioner Rillo, I think. So that we're not going to hear about it, and we don't have a chance to cross-examine, which is, uh, I, I think, um, Professor Alfred, I believe, uh, had an article in, in the National Post uh, that suggested it, it, it will undermine the confidence in the process, I believe, um, if we're not allowed to test the evidence or hear it. Yeah, and, and again, and I'm not I'm not accusing the commissioner or the commission itself uh, of any wrongdoing here, and and I mean even the commissioner, as I understand it, doesn't know what the evidence is, so so he could make a finding after he's heard it that this is something that can be disclosed. But it's very difficult for a Canadian who's already fairly skeptical of the government's approach here to have faith and confidence because the government has up until this point I'd say not had a very convincing case because all of these agencies from the OPP, Ottawa Police, Windsor Police, RCMP and CSIS are saying the Emergencies Act wasn't necessary and if the one witness that we don't get to hear from is somehow giving the magic evidence that it is that's going to be a tough pill to swallow for a lot of people. Yeah, I agree, and I, I think I think most reasonable people can see that. I mean, justice has to be done; it has to be seen to be done, uh, and the lack of transparency, I think, will will affect the confidence in the outcome. Not to say that Justice uh, Commissioner Rallo, um, you know, wouldn't wouldn't make a proper finding. It's just that, you know, we don't have a look into uh, the basis for his finding with respect to that evidence. Um, so I, th I think it's a bit of a problem. But again, we don't, as you say, Commissioner Rallo could. Um, could you know dismiss or consider the evidence um, you know as he sees fit so uh, one interesting aspect of this is, is that you have a lot of groups that have come out that are not supportive of the emergencies act even though they're they're not supportive of the convoy either i mean one notable example is the coalition of ottawa residents and businesses their their lawyer is paul champ paul champ has uh, has been critical publicly of the emergencies act his clients have not taken a position on it even though they're not obviously friends of the convoy plus you've got civil liberties groups that like the canadian civil liberties association not a wing group by any stretch that have come forward and, and their line of questioning has really been focused on i think the money and the, the bank account freezes so the democracy fund i know is a, a big supporter of, of civil liberties but but what is it that 
just from your perspective, you'd like to get out of this. I mean, what is what is the TDF's, what is a win for you as the Democracy Fund's lawyer? Well, look, I mean, we want all the evidence to be heard. I mean, we're, I think most of the lawyers want to be fair to the witnesses and give them a chance to give, uh, to recount their experiences uh, as they went through the process. Um, but TDF is concerned that this, the Emergency Act wasn't properly declared, and we really want to test that because it's an important, uh, it's an important situation. I mean, you can't just uh, arbitrarily or unreasonably declare an emergency to overcome political opposition. That's why we got rid of the uh, the War Measures Act uh, that preceded the Emergencies Act. It was just too broad. It was too sweeping. I believe one of the politicians said. You, you just wanted to move a bicycle and you got a moving van. That's what the, the powers gave you. Um, and so it was, the Emergencies Act is, is not supposed to be invoked except in, I would suggest, the most existential of crises. Um, and TDF is concerned that that might not have been the case. I think the view here is that it probably wasn't. Um, so what do we do from here? I mean, we're looking to Commissioner Lodic to provide some policy solutions, hopefully, um, if he agrees that it wasn't uh, reasonably invoked, uh, but we just don't know. So yeah, we're going to be holding the government to account. That's that's our mandate. I, I don't want to get too far ahead of things here, because I know there is still uh, testimony remaining, and there could be new witnesses even that, have, that weren't on that initial list that was published. But I've heard very conflicting things about what is going to be in the commissioner's final report. And, and as I understand it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, there doesn't need to be, based on the terms of reference or based on the Emergencies Act itself, a, a definitive ruling on it was justified or unjustified. It could just be a series of observations, a statement of facts. Do, am I understanding that properly? Yeah, I believe so. I mean, he, he, he is... Uh his mandate is to examine the conditions that led to the declaration of the emergency. So uh, he doesn't have to make any definitive uh, statement either way that it was legitimate or illegitimate. But, you know, I don't think it's going to be a series of desultory statements about, you know, what happened. I think it's going to be uh, purposive, right? It's, it's going to be relevant to the mandate he was given. So I expect to see some definitive statements about some aspect of the declaration. Um, but you're right, I, I, he's not boxed in about, you know, saying yay or nay. Well, and, and to be fair, I mean, even if he came out with the most scathing indictment of the Emergencies Act, it's, you know, the Justin Trudeau could say, okay, so what? <laughs> you know, just like come out and say, yeah, we're sorry, we didn't mean to, and, and carry on. Like, it, it doesn't take away from, I think, the need for there to be political accountability in it. But I, I think it would obviously be a lot more helpful to have this this uh, report in hand if you're an opposition party, if you're a Canadian voter, if you're uh, someone in media, and, and so on. So l let me just ask it in a similar context here. If we're talking about all of the different battles that are underway right now, we've got the uh, parliamentary report, we've got the Public Order Emergency Commission, we've got charter challenges that have been filed here. Like, where do you think the most, where, where do you think kind of the weak, the weak link in the chain is for the Emergencies Act of all of these different challenges? <sighs> That's a good question. Um, I, I just, I don't know. I mean, we've been focused obsessively on the Emergencies Act, so our minds are turned to the deficiencies in the evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, but look, there's been a lot of uh, legal challenges to aspects, um, problematic aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic and, and the dissolution of charter rights uh, that, that we're focused on. I mean, just the Quarantine Act tickets themselves um, we've, you know, we're challenging those. The the mischief charges arising out of the protests. We've, you know, representing 23 or so clients. Um, in that case, uh, that that we don't think should be convicted of anything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a whole bunch bunch of of areas where charter rights are just being tossed out of out of the window. And and you know, we'd like to fight them all, but we got to pick our battles. I mean, we're we're um, you know. Yeah suing Western University for the imposition of a, of a booster mandate, uh, you know, should should be required to be boosted umpteen times to go to, to get an education. I mean, you know, we're picking that battle, we're, we're fighting that fight in the Court of Appeal soon. 
so I, I don't know where to, you know, where to begin, Andrew. It's just there's so many areas that are problematic with respect to, to your charter rights now. When it comes to the Public Order Emergency Commission, sometimes the questions are, are more illuminating than the answers, specifically who's asking what. Like, like obviously, when Peter Slowly's lawyer is cross-examining, like you can tell that he's interested in uh, basically protecting the interests of his client and, and so on. Same as the city of Ottawa, Ottawa Police. The commissioner's questions have been interesting because I, he hasn't been asking a lot of them generally. But when he has intervened, one theme that I've noticed that he asked a few of the protesters and a few of the police was whether there was ever an alternative arrangement offered to them. Can you go and protest here instead? And the sense that I got in the answers was that that was never the case, that no one was ever actually given an alternative to have a peaceful, lawful protest when the emergencies that came up. And I think that was very interesting as well, because publicly, the line that we got, got from Justin Trudeau was that your civil liberties are intact, your charter rights are intact. But on the ground, that did not strike me as how it came out. Yeah, I, look, it's hard to read the tea leaves when you're, when you're looking at the, the questions the commissioner um, is asking. So, you know, and I, I, can't, <laughs> I can't do it. Um, but yeah, that might be the case. Uh, he, he was concerned, the commissioner was concerned about alternatives to protest. Um, we heard some interesting evidence, I think, from one of the Windsor uh, police um, authorities who said, no, no, we gave, we gave them a chance to move to the sidewalk, and then once they were on the sidewalk, we left them alone. Then he was pressed on it. He's, he, he was shown an arrest of a person who was on the sidewalk, and he said, no, no, well, well that, they were still in the red zone. Yeah. Um, so it, it wasn't clear that they actually, people actually had an opportunity to remain on the sidewalk and protest peacefully. But yeah, I think there's a conflict. I mean, the, the government said, well, you still have your charter rights to peacefully protest and assemble, but then, you know, clear out sort of thing. So that's, that's I think, obvious to people that they didn't, you know, they, they had to leave um, and there, there wasn't much of an alternative. Yeah, and I mean, I also think there's been a lot to a lot of deference by the government to the fact that the Emergencies Act says it needs to comply with the Charter, because saying it doesn't mean it actually does. And, and the government was using that as like a defense of like, no, we're not trampling on your Charter rights. It says right there, we have to respect them. Well, okay, sure, but that doesn't mean you're doing that. Right, yeah, I, I think there's a conflict there. Um, they rounded people up. Uh, I mean, we heard some some testimony about snatch and grabs. Um, you know, you got you got put in a paddy wagon and then driven out um, to you know the boonies, and then they let you off, and then you had to make a phone call to get someone to pick you up, so to don't come back into Ottawa. Um, no, I don't know how much of that happened, but we heard we did hear evidence that that happened. So, you know, I don't know. Like you say, I don't know how much uh, practically speaking people had their right to freedom uh, freely assemble and protest after the declaration was in place probably not um but you know it's hard it's yeah. hard to say very well said mark joseph with the democracy fund i know you got a few weeks left to go in the marathon so uh, keep up the good work and thanks for taking some time out to join me thanks for having me andrew all right, thank you. Let's uh, do another clip that came out today. Now, this was of Brendan Miller again, the lawyer for the Freedom Convoy organizers, in his cross-examination of the RCMP commissioner and deputy commissioner, uh, confirming once again that the RCMP was also aware that there didn't seem to be a national security threat afoot. Com commissioner Lucky, you were present for both the February 13th IRG as well as the February 14th cabinet meeting. Yes, I think there was the cabinet meeting was on the 13th. And well, the, the, uh, yeah. And so the IRG meeting, they, according to the text messages and the messages that uh, we've reviewed, they never even asked you to speak. Um, not on the, definitely not at the cabinet meeting. And I don't, I, what I did do, I don't think I spoke at either. Um, I, I thought I did because I had speaking notes but I did brief the minister before that meeting. Right, and the minister never asked you what your opinion was with respect to whether or not there was a section two cease and act security threat, is that correct? In respect to what? Whether or not there was a threat under section two as defined in the CSIS Act, if there was a threat to the security of Canada. No, he would have to ask CSIS. Right, and CSIS, you're aware, told him that there wasn't. That's what I've been told. So I'm if- gonna have to Thank you, those are my questions. 
<laughs> that's when you just like just try to slip them under the wire as you're out of time but uh you know it's like the oscars the music's playing the microphone's lowering and eventually they're about to just pull you off stage and uh, send john wayne in there or something but uh, that was an obscure reference uh john never mind uh <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to those who got it anyway. But the reason I think that's important is because the government, to go back to what Mark Joseph and I were talking about a few moments ago, had access to all of this information and they were supposed to be bringing all these stakeholders together. And if you look at the cabinet meeting minutes that have been tabled in evidence, you see on the list a bunch of non-cabinet ministers. You see, oh yes, CISA's director. Oh yes, we have uh, Brenda Lucky. Oh yes, we have the deputy public safety. All of these people. So how is it that all of these people were together, they were all putting their evidence forward, supposedly in one place, yet no one has heard the evidence that justifies the Emergencies Act? Who, who presented that and in what meeting? And why is it not in any of the minutes? That is the key question and the one we're going to be following in the remaining weeks of testimony and policy analysis. That does it for us for today. We'll talk to you tomorrow with more of Canada's most irreverent talk show here on True North. Thank you, God bless, and good day to you all. Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.